Jim Tobin, good evening. Good evening, Jim. It's great to talk to you. Uh, well, it's great to talk to you in the evening and see that you haven't even been to the bar yet. That's unusual. Well, if you, you can't see my camera all the way down to my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> A lot going on here in town today with uh, the impeachment. Uh, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, the impeachment kicked into full swing today. Uh, it's uh, it probably going to take a week. It'll it'll bleed into the early part of next week. But uh, but there's a real conflict here. You, you've got on, on one hand, you've got Democrats and and some Republicans who want to see uh, want to see the president uh, tried uh, under the under the impeachment statutes for uh, for his role in inciting the violence uh, on on February. Six. I'm sorry, January sixth in the Capitol, uh, and and then you. But you've also got uh, the big guy, uh, President Joe Biden, down at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, who looks at this as kind of a lost week for continuing to move his cabinet picks forward. So there is a pause. It's just the necessity of the way the Senate works when it's when it's sitting in in, in judgment of the the articles of impeachment. So it it'll grind through. Uh, you know, they spend eight hours a day on this thing, uh, and then I think eventually we'll get to a, a vote early next week. At this point, it looks like there will be some Republicans that vote to convict, but I, I don't think it's going to be uh, the 17 that the Democrats need in order to uh, to, to to move forward. So uh, it'll move as rapidly as it can, but uh, but I think the general feeling is that uh, it will end with not a conviction. Yeah, I, I, I got to agree with you on that. Everything I've read and everything I've heard tells me that there's no way they have the 17 Republican votes to, to convict. So they want to go through this. It'll be political theater. Uh, you will see a lot of these debate talking points uh, again in campaign ads in two years used by uh, different candidates for different offices. But once they get through with that, Jim, something that we really do have to focus on and hopefully they can get back to doing the people's business yep. and hopefully uh, this reconciliation process will go through. Now, in the first part of reconciliation, it's going to be a lot of spending and some of that we agree with. Right. Yeah. The, the, both the House and, and the Senate have passed their reconciliation. They're passed their budgets uh, and they are, they are uh, in concert with each other. So now uh, the House and the Senate then produce uh, each of the committees are given reconciliation orders and a certain budget target they're supposed to hit. And then they will report all of those bills out of their committees. Financial services looks like they're going to be done at the, at the House financial service end of this week. House Ways and Means as well. Uh, and then they, they send them all to the floor. They mash them all together in one big package and they vote on them and they move forward. The good news is, I think in the short term, this is the COVID package. There is a lot we agree with in here. Uh, we are going to see uh, some relief, more, more, more money for uh, Americans uh, to help pay their rents, to pay their back mortgages. Uh, we're going to see some more direct payments to, to, to people and for, the, for, their, for their children. Uh, we're going to see some more PPP loans. In, in general, a, a real effort to prop up uh, the economy one more time here. The second reconciliation package, which we think comes this fall, that one's going to be a little bit more perilous. I think we're going to see some tax hikes in there, whether it's the corporate rate or the individual rate. Uh, and that's where we're going to see some real policy stretches here. Uh, so in the short term, you know, okay, good news. Maybe you don't like the top the top uh, line of $1.9 trillion. Uh, but, you know, as we get deeper in the year, I think there's going to be some concern for the industry. You know, hockey players, when they get ready to get into a fight, they drop the gloves. Yeah. By the time they get into the fall, old Bernie's going to have to drop the mittens and really <laughs> drop them in. flex his political muscle to get this done. Yeah. Back when I was a tax lobbyist early in my career, uh, a senator from Texas named Lloyd Benson used yeah. to say, you know, a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. And now we're talking about a trillion dollars in spending. Right. They yeah. almost have to raise taxes. And when they raise taxes, that is going to impact our small business members. It's going to impact them on the business side, on the personal side, and even on the demand side for a lot of them. So we've really got to keep our eye on that ball and, and stay engaged in the game when we get close. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the long term aspects of these deficits and, 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 and that we're, we're hanging on us uh, is, is, is interest rates going up. We know that that is as big a factor in this housing boom over the last year are these record low interest rates. Uh, we know the Fed's going to keep things low for a while. But again, uh, if we don't get these things in control, whether it's raising, raising taxes or lowering spending, uh, you know, I think uh, that, that interest rates are going to be something that we're going to have to contend with. Again, we need to get out of this pandemic first. Uh, and I think our economists agree with with uh, with some robust spending here. But 
uh, it's, some of these bills are going to come due and, and, you know, we'll fight what battle we have in front of us, but uh, we're always thinking in 3D and in, in 3D chess, right? Well, the good news is, you know, that there is a, a vast country out there <laughs> and, and not everywhere in the United States do you have this acrimony, animosity, violence, whatever it is going on in Washington. Uh, there are places like Colorado Springs, Colorado, for example, where the economy is booming. Uh, life is good. Uh, people are moving there in droves. And we're lucky here tonight to have with us uh, the mayor of Colorado Springs, Mayor John Southers. Mr. Mayor, thanks for joining us. We appreciate having you. Glad to join you, Jerry and Jim. Good to be here. Good to see you. Well, first question I want to ask, and this is one that anyone in Washington is going to want to know the answer to. My understanding is that in your last election, you won by 74% of the vote. What's your secret? Lousy <laughs> candidates uh, running against you. Uh, I had uh, three uh, uh, candidates running against me. And quite frankly, uh, the folks from Colorado Springs will tell you that uh, it was a scary prospect that any of them might actually wind up being mayor of Colorado Springs. There you go. All these guys that spend millions on campaigns would be better off just funding some, some other people who aren't as talented to run against them. Okay, got it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we really appreciate your being here. Your, your relationship with our builders out in Colorado Springs is, is awesome. And I want to say that uh, you and I have a common friend out there in Renee Zentz. Um, sometimes she can tell you about when she tried to teach me how to ride a horse. It didn't go that well. But it was May is everyone's friend, if you haven't figured that out. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But we're really glad to have you here. And, and we understand from talking to her and even talking to you a little bit that residential construction, construction in general, is booming in Colorado Springs. And it's an important part of your economy. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, glad to do that. You know, uh, when COVID hit in March, uh, we were panicked. Uh, our city revenues uh, declined 14%. Uh, in March, they were down 23% in April, and we were modeling, uh, you know, for re revenue losses that uh, could be as large as 30%, you know, 110, 120 million. We did a salary or a, a hiring freeze. We uh, deferred all major capital projects. Uh, we cut uh, department budgets two and a half percent and just kind of laid in wait and saw how bad things would get. And then we would, you know, uh, make further adjustments as necessary. But an amazing thing happened. Uh, we have shown ourselves since then to be among, if not the most resilient uh, large city in America. And construction has been a huge part of that. Uh, I think in Colorado, as in most areas of the country, uh, construction was deemed an essential uh, enterprise, if you will, and was, was uh, relatively unabated by uh, the COVID crisis. And we happen to have both a commercial and residential construction boom uh, in Colorado Springs. Uh, some very large commercial projects uh, that are uh, generating sales and use tax. And in the midst of uh, uh, this COVID crisis, we had a record number of residential uh, uh, permits issued. Uh, the demand is uh, being generated by a couple of things. Number one, you know, for three years running now, uh, Cower Springs has been uh, rated by U.S. News and Report as the most desirable city in America. And that's not, that's based on a survey of Americans where if you could live any place in the country, where would you want to live? And uh, Cower Springs comes in uh, the tops. So when you have a situation in the country where there's a lot of good jobs in Colorado Springs, a lot of cybersecurity jobs uh, for young people, a lot of uh, software engineering jobs, high paying jobs. Uh, and people say, oh my gosh, I can move to Colorado Springs, get a high paying job. Obviously they wanna buy a house. Uh, that's creating some of the demand. And then the other part of it uh, is a little uh, less defined so far, but I'm absolutely convinced that our anecdotal of it, evidence of it is going to turn into statistical evidence over the next several months. We think there is a migration taking place in the United States as a result of the combination of COVID uh, and the social unrest uh, last summer. Uh, we now have an economy where a lot of people can choose any place to live. They're in a business where they can operate out of their home, uh, things like that. And so 
uh, people are, are making some choices. Uh, when you talk to the home builders here, where are the people coming from that are buying their homes? A lot of them from California, Illinois, uh, all, or, all sorts of states like that. Uh, and uh, that's create, you know, uh, gosh, we, nobody around Cower Springs is yelling defund the police. We love our police. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of thing is attractive to a lot of, uh, a lot of people. So uh, we're getting a lot of folks moving here, creating a uh, very high demand, but it's, it's uh, obviously uh, causing prices to go up that. And, and of course, supply change and uh, issues and just higher uh, inflation in, in the market. But as I said to you, when we talked uh, earlier, if you can imagine in a county of uh, almost three quarters of a million people, uh, we only had 460 homes for sale in the month of January uh, of this year. Uh, that was down, you know, 61%. It's the lowest number of uh, houses total in, in three decades. And Cower Springs was a heck of a lot smaller three decades ago. So, uh, it's a market where people are just crying for, for homes. And, and I think the demand for uh, new housing is uh, going to continue unabated for uh, months and months to come. You know, Mayor, that's, you talk about, you know, nationwide, we're seeing that our economists are watching this, this flight to the, you know, not even the suburbs, even farther out, like you said, they're looking for home offices and they're, they're, they're looking for more space to, to kind of get away from the virus. But like you said, they don't have to travel to work anymore and they're, they're chained to their, their, with their desks. Uh, there's, a, there's a great opportunity for, like you called it, a migration. I think that's a, a great word for it. But yet now we have this, you know, we, we as home builders, we haven't built enough homes to keep up with demand. You're talking about, you know, for, just, just over 400 homes, uh, you know, on, on the market. What are you doing as a mayor to work with Renee and our builders out there to make sure that you've got the conditions in place to be able to build affordably in Colorado Springs? Well, I think probably the, the main thing that we're doing, at least I spent an awful lot of time talking about this because Cower Springs has been growing quite rapidly for quite some time. And a lot of people lived here for a long time that aren't dependent upon uh, the current economy, draw a retirement check or whatever, always say, you know, why are we growing? Uh, why are the developers taking over the city and all that sort of thing? And I have to spend a lot of time explaining to people, look, uh, you either grow or you stagnate and there's really uh, no place in between. Uh, I have to explain to people that, look, uh, you know, when somebody says something to me, well, why are we growing? I always say, do you have children or grandchildren? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want, you know, would you like them to live in, in Cairo Springs? Oh, yeah, my son, you know, Charlie just got a new job at uh, Boeing or Martin Marietta or something. And I said, well, I hope you understand that for us to just take care of the high school and college graduates, from Cairo Springs who want to live in Cairo Springs, we have to create uh, 5,500 new jobs a year. Uh, and that means growth. And it's our job to make sure it's smart growth and it's uh, appropriately planned growth. Uh, but uh, you're, if, if none of those people can find jobs are all moving away, everybody's gonna say, oh, the town's stagnating. Um, so, you know, uh, when people want to live here, we need to respond. And I have to constantly remind people that uh, the founder of this great city uh, was a developer uh, by the name of uh, William J. Palmer, who uh, uh, came uh, west uh, with the railroad and uh, saw Pikes Peak and said, I want to build a resort city at the foot of this fantastic mountain. It's one of the few major cities in the United States that wasn't built because of a confluence of major rivers, uh, railroads, or any industry. It was built for pure aesthetics. Uh, and uh, uh, developers can, you know, good developers are vital uh, to making sure that we continue to build the kind of city that we want that reflects our uh, unbelievable natural uh, surroundings. Well, I can, I, can, I, can, I can attest to Pikes Peak's influence on a golf ball because I don't have a slice <laughs> I don't have a slice at all unless I go out there and play at the, the Broadmoor course, in which case I can't get away from that slice out there. I don't know what it is. I keep blaming the mountain, but uh, no one believes me. <laughs> well, for all of our builder members, while Jim's golfing when we're in Colorado, I'm usually meeting with Renee and the other builders uh, talking about, Mr. Mayor, something that we're really proud of, and that is our workforce development efforts out in Colorado Springs. I know that you're really involved with those and uh, what Renee and George Hess uh, and others out there have accomplished 
is really, really a, uh, a model for the rest of America. Uh, and we want to thank you for your involvement with that. And wonder if you have anything to say about that effort. Yeah, they've done a great job. The program's called Careers in Construction. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to tell you folks that uh, we've got this really strange situation going on in America in terms of our workforce. We've got a lot of kids going to college, majoring in sociology, and they're now hanging out in their parents' basement. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, uh, if they would uh, uh, take the time to look at where the jobs are, uh, and uh, uh, they would be, you know, we've, it's very frustrating to me. We've got $75,000 a year welding jobs going unfilled at some uh, industry out at the airport and takes a six, six months uh, uh, program at community college to get the proper uh, certification. Well, the same thing, we've got a, a tremendous demand uh, for uh, construction. Uh, these are well-paying jobs. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we've got all the, the vehicles to get people well-trained to take those jobs, uh, and we just need to attract them to the business. And, and Renee and the local HBA and, and careers in construction, with the great uh, help from a lot of our builders, have put together a program that's now in, uh, you know, I think a couple of dozen uh, high schools and spreading throughout the, uh, the state of Colorado, and we've got uh, kids enthusiastic about uh, construction as a as a career, uh, and and hopefully uh, it will continue to pay big dividends as we move forward, and we'll have those uh, framers and those masons and everything we ne we need uh, to meet the incredible workforce demands that we have in construction. Well, you, you, you know, Mary, you make a great point because you know earlier you talked about you know attracting jobs, Martin Marietta, Boeing, right? It's kind of those white collar jobs and in those college degree jobs, but yet you found that balance to make sure that if you're going to attract those people, you, you need you need the, the 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 skilled workforce to build those homes, uh, and that that's great to be able to find that balance out there and uh, and, and and kind of create a, a really holistic economy. There's too many people, at least I find in Washington, they're focused on those white collar jobs. You hear more of it. President Trump really did a good job over the last four years of talking about workforce development. And I suspect Joe Biden will continue that as well. But it sounds like you've really put it in practice. Well, it, it takes both. And the other, the, the other thing, even in cybersecurity, uh, I talked to those companies, they don't need, a lot of them do not need college graduates. They need the kid who hacked his way through high school, never went to the prom, never played a sport, uh, to get a couple uh, certific certifications, and that kid can make $100,000 a year. Uh, it's really incumbent upon young people to really take a look around and see uh, where the jobs are. I personally feel uh, that uh, diplomas, you know, uh, are going to be less significant, increasingly less significant, and certifications are going to become increasingly more uh, significant in, in the future job force. Uh, who can actually, who actually has the skills uh, to perform the work that we need done, uh, not who has, you know, a, a general, you know, and, and by, by the way, I, uh, I don't want to downplay a life of the mind. It's a very, very important part of, uh, you know, a, a satisfying life and things like that. But we also need to get our kids focused on uh, where, where, where where do we need uh, workforce? And uh, construction is a huge part of it. You know, Mayor, a question talk about growing, uh, you know, just, to, and, and, we can, and we'll leave this uh, topic, I guess, at some point, but because uh, I want to ask you about Governor Hickenlooper and you sending him, uh, the voters of Colorado sending him to, to my way in Washington, D.C. here. Uh, but but land land prices are as much a problem, the, the regulations go into it, but w w just to kind of put a bow on it, how do you plan for the future of Colorado Springs with land availability and, and that smart growth? You know, what are, what are the things that you're looking for to help expand? Well, first of all, the game in the uh, uh, high desert West for us is water. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's truly amazing about Colorado Springs is uh, we've got a confluence of two relatively small creeks, a monument uh, Creek and uh, fountain Creek. Uh, which flow into the Arkansas River Basin. Um, in fact, when Palmer started the city, uh, he was mocked by some other uh, pioneers, a uh, uh, guy named Meeker who started uh, Greeley, uh, who said, hey, I'm on the South Platte River. You're, ne you're never going to make it 
uh, unless you've got a, a, a you're on large uh, river. Well, through incredible foresight by uh, the founders of Colorado Springs and successive jurisdictions, uh, of successive generations, we have acquired an enormous amount of uh, water rights, uh, including on the west slope of Colorado and have a very, very complicated uh, system whereby we pump water over the mountains. It's really an amazing system. Uh, just in the last couple of years, Colorado Springs has completed a, uh, a water transfer system out of the uh, Pueblo Reservoir, the Arkansas River. Uh, at the cost of $825 million, deli will deliver up to 55 million uh, gallons a day. Uh, so we have enough, we have a little short of 500,000 in the city of Cower Springs right now. We have enough water for a million and with technology and re reuse and things like that, um, that will only continue uh, to expand. So that's the number one issue. Uh, the other interesting issue is uh, while there's no place to go west because of the mountains, we're right at the front range, uh, there is a lot of land uh, to the north and east. And as long as there's water, uh, that's uh, developable land. Uh, frankly, for the city, uh, there, there's some very interesting issues. Um, if you, when I first became mayor six years ago and somebody said, oh, gee, we want to annex a whole bunch of uh, property and uh, we want the city to annex it, you know, and build several thousand more homes, uh, my response was typically show me the Walmart uh, because uh, our, our property taxes are, are pretty low in Colorado. And uh, they've gotten so low and it's a very complicated uh, it was a citizen uh, initiative that called Tabor Taxpayer Bill of Rights, in in combination with something called Gallagher, that has that got our uh, property values or our property taxes pretty low, and so uh, the problem is that property taxes to the city themselves don't pay much for uh, the infrastructure that that needs to be developed. That caused newer de developments in Colorado Springs to have special districts. Where, whereby the people that buy the houses, you know, wind up paying uh, more to help pay for the infrastructure and things like that. But things are changing. Um, and one of the big factors that has, are changing things is online sales. Remember in 2018, they weren't taxable by local government and the, the United States Supreme Court decided a case out of South Dakota that said you could um, collect uh, for, uh, for sales at the point of delivery. And so all of a sudden rooftops have taken on a new economic uh, significance. And so the, the question in Colorado Springs is, uh, we're not going to stop the growth. It's either going to take place in the unincorporated county or in the city. And what worries us is if they're, uh, if they're developing in the un unincorporated county, and relying on a water district that doesn't have nearly the uh, water reliability uh, that uh, the city of Colorado Springs has, are they going to come crying to the city of Colorado Springs in 20 years and saying, you know, we're dying of thirst and we want, we, we need your water? And are they going to develop in a way uh, that, uh, uh, you know, isn't comp compliant with the city in terms of curb and gutter? We've got some areas in Colorado Springs that are unincorporated county because they used to be on the, the outskirts. The city's growing around them and there's no economic benefit to the city to take in these places that have so much need for uh, infrastructure. So uh, we're, we've got an uh, intergovernmental agreement with the county where in a buffer around Colorado Springs, which is really drawn by Colorado Springs utilities, uh, anybody who wants to develop in that, the county has to send them uh, to the city so we can consider uh, annexation before they're allowed to develop in the uh, unincorporated county. And I think uh, this will, will cause for better planning by the city in terms of meeting utility needs and, and things like that. A lot of discussions going on. And how, what's the impact of NIMBYism out there? Are you starting to get any of it? Oh, absolutely. There's always, uh, you, you guys are in the <laughs> development business. There's always uh, uh, NIMBYism, particularly in the affordable housing area. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's a fairly affluent area of, of town called uh, Broadmoor Bluffs, uh, really nice houses. And uh, right off a major highway, 115, uh, there's a, an, an academy, big intersection. There's a, a commercial development uh, there. And then as you go up the mountain, you get to these high-priced homes. 
and uh, the this the uh, a developer wanted to build a uh, affordable housing project in the kind of the commercial area, and uh, it it was properly zoned for them. I mean, they didn't need anything, uh, any zoning changes or anything, and it was approved nine to nothing by the uh, the city council. But oh my gosh, the pushback, and it was uh, you know pretty thinly veiled. Uh, uh, bias. They said, oh, these poor kids are going to have to walk two blocks to school. Or, And really, of course, I understand they were concerned about what it does. To, it's a very high performing school district or the, you know, the kids that are living in this affordable housing project going to bring back down the performance of the school and things like that. But it's interesting, a study just came out uh, because one of the big things is, oh, it's going to uh, undermine property values. Well, guess what? I mean, this study shows absolutely that the affordable housing projects that have been improved that have been approved uh, in the last decade in Colorado Springs have had no adverse impact uh, on uh, on housing values, which has always been our because you know there it's not right in the middle of an affluent neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, in an area that uh, you know may lead to that affluent uh, uh, neighborhood, but yeah, NIMBYism is alive and well and. Uh, don't expect it to go away anytime soon because it, it seems to be kind of a chronic condition of, in American society. You know, you talk about uh, taxing deliveries. I read an article over the weekend that a mayor that you probably don't have that much in common with, uh, Mayor de Blasio of New York, is uh, <laughs> planning on taxing or wanting to tax every package delivered to any home in New York City, $15 or $13 a delivery. <laughs> he wonders why people are leaving New York and moving. Yeah, it, it's it's mind-boggling. Um, you know, I I uh, some of my mayor friends, I'm just uh, I just have to shake my head uh, how they handled uh, some of the problem, um, uh, some of the problems this summer. You know, where they just kind of surrendered uh, downtown areas in Seattle. They basically let the protesters take over a police substation. I just don't get it. I just don't understand why they think that that uh, is an appropriate approach. Uh, but uh, it is what it is and you get the government you vote for. Uh, I, I got a tip from people in Texas that I, I'm gonna try and impress upon uh, some of the local uh, uh, folks that maybe we ought to put up billboards that say next time you uh, you vote, remember why you moved to Colorado, Colorado and what it was about the place you lived that made you move to Colorado and uh, be careful uh, how you vote because, uh, yeah, there's some crazy things going on in this country. Uh, we have a question coming in from our chairman of the board, uh, Mr. Chuck Falk. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chairman Falk is a former uh, Major League Baseball player who wants to know if you've ever attended the Junior College World Series in Grand Junction. I actually have, but I have to confess, I did not drive over just for that. I happened to be doing uh, business in uh, uh, Grand Junction at the time it was taking place. And uh, uh, some of the officials that I was uh, dealing with at the time, uh, we went over and watched a couple of games. It's a great event. Um, and uh, y y that, that individual may be interested to know that in the realignment of uh, minor league baseball, as you know, a lot of uh, franchises have uh, gone out of business, but um, uh, Grand Junction and Colorado Springs are going to become uh, rivals. The Rocky Mountain vibe, vibes uh, in Colorado Springs and the Grand Junction Rockies are going to be, I think we play each other 16 times next summer. Uh, so it, it will be uh, one of the most hotly contested uh, uh, rivalries. That's terrific. Now, do we have other questions for the mayor from our audience? Yes. In the Q&A um, box, we have a couple of questions. Um, so we have a question um, about workforce development. So in terms of workforce development and it being incumbent on the next generation to look at the opportunities around, how can we more, be more like a beacon calling them toward the ecosystem of construction? Well, we've talked a little bit about that. And uh, um, uh, the, the local home builders association has done a fantastic job. And I think the Colorado home builders association has uh, jumped on top of that uh, or jumped on the bandwagon uh, with a careers in construction program uh, to not only tell kids about 
all the attractive jobs that there are in construction, and but how easy it is to get there and uh, uh, actually put programs in the high schools. Uh, I, one of the things I'm really heartened by is the, the return of vocational education uh, to our high schools. And I, I'm, as I said, uh, frank discussions with kids about uh, better off uh, in an area where you can actually find a job than you are uh, with a college degree living in your uh, parents' basement in an area where you can't find a job. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's a really, really important thing to do. And I think we're doing a good job of it. And I really encourage uh, folks around the country to look at what's going on uh, in uh, Colorado and Colorado Springs in particular in terms of uh, promoting careers in construction. You have another one, Reagan? I do. Um, so what is the impact of construction defects, um, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, what that's about is a, a very, very frustrating situation we've had in Colorado, and I suspect uh, it's taking place in other states, where the trial lawyers who have a lot of clout in the legislature, and particularly, you know, Colorado used to be a relatively red state. Uh, worst case, even though we had a lot of Democrat governors, we had both of the houses were uh, uh, red and in, uh, you know, then we kind of had split government. Unfortunately, right now, um, we've got uh, pretty big majorities uh, by the Democrats uh, in both houses of the legislature. And of course, the governor's uh, a Democrat. And, you know, I don't want to get uh, too general about things, but the fact of the matter is the trial lawyers appear to have more sway generally uh, with Democrats than they do uh, with Republicans. And the trial lawyers, uh, you know, push through a construction defect a law, uh, oh gosh, more than a decade ago, that basically brought condominium construction to a halt. Uh, it just became um, uh, the, the liability issues uh, caused people uh, just to go elsewhere uh, in, in terms of not, not other types of construction when I say elsewhere. Uh, single family, uh, 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 multifamily, things like that, but not, and it, it's really too bad because, uh, you know, given the millennials uh, flocking into uh, Colorado in general and El Paso County in particular, we have the fastest growing millennial population in the country coming for these really good jobs that I described to you. Uh, kind of memes would be a good product for them, um, but uh, we have you know, had some minor victories. Uh, we had a minor court victory where the Supreme Court uh, upheld arbitration clauses. The cities uh, have tried to, you know, do what they, in the areas that they could affect, pass some ordinances to kind of try and work around the construction defect. Uh, but we really haven't made, and, and it's really interesting to me because you know, even our, our Democratic mayors, including the uh, Democratic mayor of uh, uh, Denver, uh, who's uh, pretty left of center, has been crying out for uh, reform to uh, fix the construction defect laws, and let's get back to uh, constructing uh, uh, condominiums. And uh, uh, so far, uh, we haven't been able to pull it off. Uh, we just talked about it the other day. We'll continue to strategize uh, uh, how to approach the subject, but um, we haven't we haven't been successful. We try very hard every year, but uh, so far uh, we haven't had much luck. Yeah. I think we have Tom Reagan maybe for one more if there's one in the box. Yeah, I have a question from Larry Katie who asked, uh, can we start to create a trades program where there is some finishing skills uh, like dressing, writing, and presentation? As a board member of the local vocational school, Larry sees a big hole in this finishing piece for the graduating student. It might help take some of the stigma that the parents hold against trades as a great profession. That's for all of you. Yeah, that's really for you guys. Uh, um, you probably uh, have more knowledge of what he's talking about than I do. Yeah, Larry, in fact, some of our um, uh, programs under HBI and some of the independent programs that we have around the country with various home builder groups in Iowa and other states, stress what they call the soft skills, uh, timeliness, cleanliness, uh, being able to, to, to speak to a, a potential employer or when you're employed to a customer or a client. So it's a very good point and something that I know that our vocational efforts are beginning to really emphasize much more strongly. 
Yeah, and Larry, you make a good point because is you know as Jerry said, we're you treat you, you teach them these soft skills because in in five or ten years from now they're they're, they're now our new entrepreneurs. They're going to start their own their own companies, hire their own people, and so uh, th those the, how to write a business plan. Th those things are really important to the kind of really developing a a really uh, robust workforce that that's got you know it's one thing to teach them how to measure and, and, and cut and hammer. It's another thing to teach them how to live and, and, and be future businessmen and women. So Larry, I think it's a great point. Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, I want to tell you that uh, in, in knowing you're a Notre Dame guy, uh, we kicked all Clemson people off of our board uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Good. Uh, we'll in tomorrow, but we wanted to, uh, to thank you and you get the last word. Well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, for a lot of things. Uh, on, let me tell you, on behalf of the citizens of Colorado Springs, uh, I'm very, very thankful to the construction industry for the tremendous role they've played uh, in helping us navigate through uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, it, it just, we wouldn't be where we're at. You know, uh, we're a, a tourism town. Uh, it's well over a billion dollar industry and tourism was down 40%. Uh, we would have had huge uh, revenue deficits were it not for uh, the, the pace that construction has uh, uh, continued at. So uh, you're doing great work. Uh, I still believe very strongly that home ownership uh, is the American dream, and I don't think that's going to change uh, anytime soon. Uh, and we just got to make sure that... Uh, uh, we do as much as we can to make sure that we've got a, a political climate uh, that's conducive uh, to home ownership uh, because it's a, a big, big part of what makes America the great, uh, great place that it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've been joined tonight by uh, Mayor John Southers from Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I will put in the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce pitch for the Springs. Uh, when we get back to normal travel, if you haven't been to Colorado Springs, you're really missing something. You're here. Everything from the Garden of the Gods to the Air Force Academy uh, to the great golf courses where you'll find Jim Tobin, uh, <laughs> go to Colorado Springs. You'll have a great time. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thanks very much. Thank you. Jim, thank you for this evening and for housing developments. I'm Jerry Howard. And I'm Jim Tobin. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.